Ani Yashikian was the middle child in a family of three daughters. A native of Windsor, Ontario, she worked as a self-employed paralegal in Toronto, mainly working in traffic court. She had an adventurous spirit and loved to travel. The 30-year-old had visited almost 30 different countries. She preferred solo travel, but made at least two international trips with others in 2008. In October, she and her boyfriend, Wendell Walsh, went on a trip to Costa Rica, Panama, and Nicaragua. Almost immediately after her arrival home, Ani decided to join two of her friends she knew through work on a trip to Asia. At most, there were only four days between when Ani decided to make this trip and when she left on it. Ani was adventurous, but not irresponsible. She normally did a lot of research before traveling to a new country, so this last-minute trip was surprising to her family. Ani could be spontaneous, but this 11th hour decision was unusual, even for her. Ani and her two friends arrived in Beijing on October 25, 2008. Their plan was to explore the city together, and then Ani's two travel companions would continue on to Vietnam, while Ani decided to travel to India instead. There, Ani planned to spend several weeks on a yoga retreat, and then return to Canada to spend Christmas with her family. Around 12.30 a.m. on October 30th, Ani's two travel companions heard her exiting their hotel room. They did not think this unusual at first. Ani mainly traveled alone and was used to exploring cities by herself. She had previously gone out exploring all night alone. She may have also still been jet-lagged. The middle of the night in Beijing is the middle of the day in Toronto. What Ani's friends did find troubling was her behavior later that morning. Ani returned to the hotel room while her friends were out for the day, took a bath, and gathered her belongings. She then left the hotel room with everything she had brought with her on the trip. She did not leave a note or in any way say goodbye to the two friends she had come on the trip with. According to Ani's sister Rosie, she was a free spirit who hated schedules. She preferred traveling solo and did not like booking tours or group trips with set itineraries. She theorizes that Ani may have left without saying goodbye because she was struggling with making her plans around those of her two friends. It is unknown exactly what Ani did or where she stayed between October 30th and November 9th. At some point, she traveled from Beijing to the city of Xi'an, most likely by train, since there is no official record of her travel. We only know that she was in Xi'an because she arrived in Hong Kong from Xi'an on November 9th on a Dragonair flight. Again, it is unknown where Ani stayed while she was in Hong Kong. Witnesses would later report seeing her around Chungking Mansions on November 10th. Chungking Mansions is one building that houses numerous shops and small hotels, known for providing cheap accommodations for travelers. While Hong Kong itself is generally safe and has a low crime rate, this particular building does not have a great reputation. There is nothing confirming that Ani actually was staying somewhere in the Chungking Mansions, however. Surveillance cameras in the Causeway Bay MTR station captured the last known images of Ani just after midnight on November 11th. In the footage, she is seen getting cash from an ATM two times. She withdrew a total of 2,800 Hong Kong dollars, which is roughly equivalent to 358 US dollars, or $470 Canadian. She was alone in the footage and seemed relaxed, although she did look over her shoulder a few times. Ani's family confirmed that it was her in the footage, but asked that it not be released to the public because they were the last images they had of her. Some of the images were leaked to the South China Morning Post a year after they were taken and are available on YouTube, but will not be reproduced here in order to respect the family's wishes. At 8.30 a.m. on the 11th, Ani sent the last communication she had with her family. She sent her younger sister Saucy a text message asking her to wish their two-year-old niece a happy birthday. Ani had not used her email account since November 5th, when she sent her last email. It was common for Ani to go a few days without contacting anyone while she was traveling. This did not usually concern her loved ones. According to Ani's boyfriend Wendell, she was a smart woman and an experienced traveler who knew how to take care of herself and take necessary precautions while abroad. Wendell and Saucy both emailed Ani after November 11th, but never received responses to their messages. Their concerns grew over the next few weeks. A major sign of trouble came when Ani failed to wish her other niece a happy birthday, two weeks after she had sent her last text message to the family. Ani's family assumed that she had been in contact with Wendell, and Wendell assumed that she had been in contact with her family. 
It was not until Wendell spoke with Ani's sister that they realized that no one had been in contact with Ani in almost three weeks. Since Ani went missing outside of the country of her citizenship and where her family was located, reporting her missing was a complicated political affair. Her family first went to police in Canada, who in turn had to contact the Foreign Affairs Department, who then contacted Hong Kong police to report her missing on December 9th. Ani's family has spoken highly of the police in Hong Kong and how seriously they have taken Ani's disappearance. Immigration officials say that Ani never left Hong Kong. However, there is a small chance that Ani may have circumvented the required checkpoints to leave the country by leaving it by boat. Since her trip to Asia was so last minute, Ani only had time to get a visa to enter China, and planned to apply for the visa she would need to stay in India for an extended amount of time once she got to Asia. However, she never applied for or received this visa. Since she did not have the visa, there was a remote hope that she was sticking to her plan, and had found a way to travel from Hong Kong to India without having to go through customs at any point along the way. Ani had purchased a plane ticket to return to Canada on December 15th, on an Air Canada flight from New Delhi. Authorities were sent to the airport to see if Ani showed up to her scheduled flight. They then had the task of notifying her family that she did not come to the airport or board her flight home. Wendell Walsh traveled to Hong Kong just before Christmas to help search for Ani and meet with the police. He was helped by a group of local volunteers and passing out flyers in the area where she went missing, which advertised the reward for information about Ani that was being offered. Eventually, Wendell had to return to Canada with no new information about his missing girlfriend. Ani's younger sister, Saucy, made similar trips in January and May of 2009, and similarly had no luck in finding Ani. The volunteer efforts to spread the word about Ani's disappearance did generate some potential leads. There were two unconfirmed sightings of Ani in Hong Kong long after she stopped communicating with her loved ones. A 19-year-old British student named Luke Pierce came forward claiming to have spoken with a woman who looked like Ani on December 2, 2008, on Kingston Street in Causeway Bay. The woman was lost and asked him for directions on how to get to a nearby Ikea. He walked the woman one block over to make sure she saw where it was after she told him how frustrated she was, having wandered around looking for the store all morning. Once the store came into view, she told Luke that she had her bearings back. The other potential sighting occurred a few weeks after Luke's interaction with the woman looking for Ikea. A witness reported that he had met a woman who matched Ani's description and spoke with a Canadian accent in Wan Chai sometime around Christmas. Since Ani's entire trip to Asia was unplanned, and her diversions to Xi'an and then Hong Kong were made seemingly impulsively, it is possible that she decided to abandon her plans to go to India and stay in Hong Kong through December. However, Hong Kong is an expensive city, and there was no activity on Ani's bank accounts or credit card after the ATM withdrawals on November 11th. The 2,800 Hong Kong dollars she withdrew would probably not have lasted her until Christmas, even if she stayed in the inexpensive hostels she was used to staying in while traveling. Months and then years went on without any sign of Ani or any of her belongings. Her family did not give up on her, however. Her sisters continued making periodic trips to Hong Kong and opened social media accounts to help spread the word about Ani's disappearance. They did not immediately hire a private investigator because they were concerned that it would interfere with the official police investigation. Eventually, they did hire one, a retired police detective named Guy Shira, to help search for Ani. Guy has been very open to the possibility that Ani voluntarily disappeared, although he is still puzzled by how she could have done so without some sort of record on her bank records, cell phone, or passport. Guy spoke with the authorities in Hong Kong and asked them to formally look into the possibility that Ani had traveled by boat, and therefore not left a trace with customs officials, to Macau. Guy believed the search should be turned towards Macau because Ani spoke Portuguese. As a former colony of Portugal, Macau still maintains Portuguese as one of its official languages. However, only approximately 2% of the population actually speaks the language. Around the fourth anniversary of Ani's disappearance, Guy persuaded the family to turn over Ani's private journal that had been left in Canada. Guy then turned the journal over to a police psychologist because he was concerned about Ani's state of mind around the time she went missing. Guy claims that Ani was acting strangely because of the last minute trip, the fact that she had closed one of her bank accounts, and her claims to her family that she was moving to Argentina and had a job lined up there. She did not have the necessary visa to move to Argentina. 
None of these details necessarily indicate that Ani was not well mentally, however. Ani's trip was more last minute than her normal trips, but was not entirely out of character. Whether her Asia trip was a sign of mental stress on her part is therefore up for debate. Given the fact that she was going on an extended trip, it may well have been necessary for Ani to close one of her bank accounts to finance it. Guy seems to interpret Ani's plans to move to Argentina as strange behavior. While she had not applied for a visa to make this move, her Asia trip and lack of visa for India show that it was not out of character for her to deal with these bureaucratic details at the last possible minute. The move was not some sort of fantasy she tried to parade as real, but a plan she had been discussing and working out the details of for some time. She had traveled to Argentina earlier in 2008, so she had the opportunity to make an informed decision to move there and potentially make contacts that helped her find a job. She was planning to move in January of 2009, and she and her boyfriend had been discussing the possibility of him coming with her. Since she owned her own business, she had the ability to make such a move without giving notice to an employer. More than a decade has passed since Ani went missing with no activity on her cell phone, her financial accounts, or her passport. None of her belongings have ever turned up. Even if she could have somehow managed to make herself vanish so thoroughly, her family does not believe that she would have abandoned the close relationships she had with them. They continue to hold out hope that one day, Ani will come home. <laughs>